your life. <laughs> okay. I will let you know. And okay. And we are live right now. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another Smile Shadower session. Today, we are so, or maybe tonight, we are so excited to have Dr. Aki Sain, and she is a board certified pediatric dentist. And to everyone watching, thank you very much. And feel free to leave any questions you have in the chat box. And with that being said, Dr. Al Hussein, you can take it away when you are ready. Hello, thank you so much for the lovely introduction. Um, I actually go by Dr. Reem just because it's so much easier and the kids can always pronounce that. So um, just a little bit about myself. I, um, let me see. So I, this is a, um, me and my husband, I'm really big on traveling, whether it's for fun or for service. Um, I've been lucky to be part of the NYU outreach program where I get to go with NYU dental students and we go, unfortunately with COVID that hasn't happened this year, but we go and provide dental service and it's a part of my job that I love very much. And that's one thing with dentistry that people don't realize what you can do with it and how much you can do with it. It's, there's so many different settings. So this is actually in um, Nepal. Um, we had a, we were in a monastery with some kids and we were, you know, doing some fluoride, some fillings. And um, these were the, with the older kids um, in uh, that, and it was in Cambodia. So something that I really enjoyed doing. So let me tell you a little bit about my educational background. So I actually started at George Mason University where I did a um, BA in political and persuasive communication. And I'll talk later about how you don't necessarily have to be a science major. You know, you could really pretty much do anything you want to do as long as you do your pre-dental requirements. And I went ahead and did a minor in business because everyone I spoke to that was in dental school used, or uh, later on as a dentist who was practicing always said, you know, the dentistry is easy. It's running the business that's hard. So having that was helpful, but let me tell you, it wasn't enough. <laughs> I still had a lot of learning to do on my own. Um, and then I wanted to stay uh, in a state school and I'm from Virginia. So I went to VCU. Um, that's where I got my doctor of dental surgery and I completed the ADEX dental licensing exam. I had an awesome four years there. I absolutely loved VCU. I was really um, lucky to have really great professors who truly cared about their dental students and they had a really good clinical background. And you know, I always say this, when you're looking for a school, there's every school is gonna have their strengths and their weaknesses. Um, I would say VCU had a really strong clinical background, whereas maybe they weren't really big on research and you know things like that, that bigger schools would have. So it really is kind of what you're looking for. Um, but for me, I really wanted those strong clinical skills. Um, and then I went ahead and I continued at NYU it's a joint hospital academic program um, with Bellevue Hospital. And I completed my pediatric dentistry um, specialty there. Um, I chose the city just because I really wanted to see a diversity of cases. And, you know, with the city, you really get everything. Um, you get the boring cases, the crazy cases, the rare cases, you know, and you have, you know, being at Bellevue. So that's another thing I would tell you to really look into when you're applying to schools, like what kind of, you know, yes, you want to get in, but also you're interviewing them and you're making sure that they have what you want. Um, and I, then I completed my American Board um, of Pediatric Dentistry. So I became a, um, a diplomat, which is board certification. You, it's not a requirement to practice as a pediatric dentist, but it really is, you know, if you want to be the on the top percentage in your field, really um, be um, aware of all the new techniques, new technology, new research out there. I definitely would recommend that, you know, you always strive to be the best that you can in your specialty. All right, so let me talk to you about why I personally chose pediatric dentistry. Um, I know a lot of you are still thinking, I just want to get into dental school right now. I'm not even there, you know, and I completely understand. I remember being in your shoe, but, you know, it's good to just kind of start like listening to and hearing about the different specialties doesn't necessarily mean you can commit to one. And I know some people are like, oh, I already know I want to be an orthodontist or I want to be that. 
And that's totally fine too, but just keep your options open because when you go into dental school and when you learn about other opportunities and specialties, you might realize that you might like something that you didn't even think about. So for me personally, actually my father was an orthodontist. So growing up, I thought I was gonna be an orthodontist. And I was like, this is so cool, I love it. Until I went to dental school. And I realized that I loved drilling and extracting and doing crowns and I couldn't give that up and just bend wires all day. That's what I tell my father. I make fun of him all the time. I'm like, all you do is bend wires, you know? We actually do the real work. So, you know, for pediatric dentistry, I one, I loved the science. So I knew I wanted to go to dental school. It was dental school or medical school for me. Um, and then I just love the balance that you have with dentistry. You get, it's more flexibility in your hours. If you wanna have a family life, it's really nice that you have that flexibility. And then just kids are something else to work with. They're so much fun. Every kid is completely different, very unique. Every kid, you'll have to use different behavior management techniques. So not, not one day is the same as the previous day. And I like that. It always keeps me on my feet. I'm never bored. It's always challenging, you know? So I personally, it keeps me on my toes. And I like that where some people kind of like that monotone every day it's the same I'm expecting the same thing so um, and when I was in second year of dental school I started shadowing in the pediatric department and that's when I realized I love that goofy environment I love how innocent kids are I love gaining the trust of a kid who's so fearful and how gratifying that feeling is and that's when I realized I wanted to do peds all righty so I know that's what you guys really want to hear how to prep for that acceptance letter. So I always say, for me, I always say there's two things, right? There's two categories. There are things that are easier to control and things that are harder to control. So things that are easier to control, I say is, for example, letters of recommendations, right? You can gain, you can have a really good letter of recommendation if you do the planning correctly. For example, you know that you're gonna take a science class your freshman year and your sophomore year. And you know that that professor teaches both classes. Try to stick with the same professor and develop a relationship with that professor. Don't wait till it's your junior year and be like, oh, I took that class with 300 other people. And for you guys, it's like virtual maybe. So he, they don't even meet you. They don't know anything about you. And all of a sudden you're like, hi, can you write me a really good letter of recommendation? So you know what? They might write you a good recommendation letter of recommendation, but will it be a really good one? They don't know you. I don't think so. And guess what? You can tell. I used to um, be on the student board where we looked at letters of recommendation. And I can tell you when we read a really good letter of recommendation versus like, okay, it's nice. It, it's nothing special, you know? So put the work in, go in, meet your professors early on, tell them that you're applying to dental school and you're working towards it. You know, go after hours or write emails um, and just really get to know your professors and let them get to know you so they can write a good letter of recommendation. And I always say, try to diversify them. So look, like I, the way I saw it is every letter of recommendation, I wanted it to um, show one aspect of my personality. So if one was more focused on my science ability that I could do good in science classes. Another one, like my communication professor, I wanted him to talk about, you know, how I'm good at communicating with people. And that's a big part of me. And, and I had a volunteer organization that I've volunteered with, write me a letter of recommendation. So every letter of recommendation showed a different aspect of who I was as a person. So try to make sure they're not redundant. They're not saying the same thing. And don't be afraid to tell that to your professor. And I always actually tell everyone to ask this question. Ask your professors, can you write me a really good letter of recommendation? Don't tell them, can you write me a letter of recommendation? Anyone can write you a letter of recommendation. Your neighbor might as well write you a letter of recommendation. It's about getting a really good one, okay? So this is something that's easier to control. And I always tell people, people don't put enough effort in getting that really good letter because it makes a difference. Another thing that's easier to control is your involvement in school. Again, I know that's a struggle for you guys with COVID this year and not being involved in so many organizations, but I'm sure there are other opportunities. Like 
being part of this club, for example, you know, it shows that you're going above and beyond and trying to be part of a community. Because guess what, being a healthcare provider, I don't care if you're the smartest or genius, and you're really good at science, and you have a 4.5 GPA or whatever, if you can't talk to people, and you can, you're not a person who really cares about your patients, you're not going to be a good doctor, you could be a really you know, we have the best grades and everything that won't make you a good healthcare provider. So they want to make sure that you're going to be able to succeed in that environment. And you have the emotional intelligence and you have the care and the genuine interest to really help people because it's not for everybody. So that's why I always say diversify in your community service and your shadowing opportunities and your, um, you know, involvement in student organizations. All these things really matter. Now, the harder things to control, I always say, are the more objective things. So I would say maybe your grades and your DAT, right? Even though those, part of it you can control, you could study your butt off and make sure you put in the work you need to to get good grades. Um, but again, it's remember, it's about time management during college. Like, I'll tell you, I had a great time in college, but I knew when was time for me to be in the library and study and when it was time for me to have fun. I, I by no means, I always tell everyone, don't just be in the library. It's not going to be for your sanity. You need to have fun. You need to grow. You need to be part of bigger things. You need to meet people. It's, it's part of your college experience. But at the same time, stay focused, know what your goals are and achieve them. Alrighty, and for the DAT, I'll talk about that a little later. So uh, we were talking about, so college pre-dental requirements, you have courses in biology. I think it was a year of biology, a year of general chemistry, a year of organic chemistry, a year of physics. And some schools do require calculus and what other schools don't. Um, I took it just because I didn't wanna be limited to which schools I can go to and and which ones don't. And I know it's like calc, really, nobody wants to take calc, but you know, just do it. It's just a few months, get it over with and open up your opportunities for more schools. Um, like I told you, you could be a science or a non-science major. I always say having a non-science major is probably just a little bit harder just because you're still gonna need to take all your science requirements plus another major, which means you need more planning on your part. That being said, you know, early on, plan out your courses, be like fall of freshman year, I'm going to take these classes, spring, really take the time to meet with your counselor and plan it right, because you don't want to be put in a situation where you're like, oh, I needed this prerequisite. And that's not all that's only offered in spring. And there you are stuck in a situation that could have been avoided. The more you know, early on, the more you could, you know, manage your schedule much better. And, you know, finish on time and whatnot. Um, I spoke to you about the letters of recommendation. Always make sure they're diversified. You really want to try to aim for a 3.5 GPA and higher. That being said, if you have a 3.4, I'm not saying you're not going to get into dental school, okay? I always say, if there is a will, there's a way. You know, I had so many of my friends in dental school who, had a pro who applied two times. I even had someone who applied three times you'll eventually get in if that's what you want to do. Just put in the effort and really try your best. Uh, for the DAT, I always say, the DAT, you need to practice for it. You just need practice, practice, practice. Um, a part of it is maybe there's things that you might like, for example, the, um, what was it called? The perceptual ability part, you know? The first time I did that, I was like, what? What am I looking at? What are these shapes? What are these angles? I don't, I'm like, I was so overblown. And then I, the more I did it, the more I did it and did it. And I took um, a, a practice class. I did a Kaplan. I always say, I don't know if it's necessary these days. There are so many resources. But for me, the DAT destroyer, I would say was the best that I really thought was the most helpful. And just doing these on a daily basis for like three, four months, it's crazy how you progress. You just get the hang of it. So definitely practice and study for it. It is a test that if you study for, you can perform well. It's not whether, oh, it's either, I, you know, you're smart or you're not. I, I don't like when I hear that from people. It's a practice. These tests were made that if you keep practicing, you start to see a trend. You start to see a pattern. 
and you, you can do way better and score way better that way. And last, just being a well-rounded individual, you know, have some leadership skills, community service opportunities, make sure that you're involved, um, make sure that you have dental experience. They want to know, why do you want to go to dental school? If you really want to go to dental school, you should have at least shadowed somebody in dentistry or talked to a dentist or done something, right? You don't want to just get into dental school and be like, what? This is what dentistry is? be completely shocked and believe it or not it happens we have you know i remember people in my class who dropped out you know the first semester because they didn't realize like that's what they were going to do and get usually it's the people who really didn't shadow as much and it's a big commitment let me tell you dental school isn't the funnest time it was it's not something that i ever want to do again and but what keeps you going is that you know that this is what you want to do and you're willing to work hard for it. So I can't imagine you being in a field that you don't like and only realizing that when you put all this time and effort to get in and then say, wait, I don't like this. This isn't for me. So make sure you shadow. And there's so many dentists in your communities that are more than willing to help you and have you come in. And now that more people are being vaccinated, you know, we have somebody every, literally almost every month at the office shadowing. You know, we even have high school students come in. So just reach out to dentists, look in, like literally go to on Google and see dentists nearby and just email them. You'd be surprised how many people would be just willing to have you come in. And if you're in the area, you guys can always come into my practice. I'm at Tyson's, and I'm in Tyson's, Virginia. I'll have my information at the end and you guys can email me. Um, I'd be more than happy to help you. All right, so this is the dental school educational requirements. So you have to attend a dental school that's accredited by the American Dental Association. Um, to be accepted into these schools, you have to have at least two years of pre-dental education. That being said, you don't need to have a degree actually. So you don't have to have your bachelor's degree. I always say you should just to back up on something. But um, I know some people who just, you know, do it, get the pre-dental requirements and just apply. Um, after graduating from dental school, you're going to have to take a test, a licensed exam, um, depending on what state you're going to practice in. All right, just to change it up a little bit, some fun facts. Did you know that teeth are the hardest substance in the human body? So the enamel, which is this outside layer of your tooth, is actually the strongest part in your body. So it's actually harder than bone. So fun fact. Alrighty, so um, during dental school, so it's a four-year program, um, you're going to have both the clinical portion and the didactic courses. The didactic courses, we are basically going to take gross anatomy, um, you're going to do neurology, microbiology, biochemistry, pathology, physiology, and histology, so a lot of sciences. This is why it's important that you perform well in your science courses in undergrad, because that's how schools determine whether you'll be able to handle the work. If you're barely passing by in undergrad with your biology or genetics, they're thinking, well, if she or he can't handle that, they're not going to handle that at dental school. So this is where these, you know, your grades are important because they reflect your ability to perform well in dental school in the didactic courses. And if you didn't do well, it's okay. You could always retake a course, but if you retake it, make sure you do better. They, they wanna make sure that you do better because if you, let's say you failed a class and then you retook it and you got a C, that does not look good. But let's say you failed a class and the next time you got an A, that looks really good. It looks like you, it shows that you kept on going, you didn't give up and you have the ability to perform well. All right. Um, and then you have courses in clinical sciences, you're in laboratory dental techniques. So you're learning how to drill, how to hold the handpiece, how to do fillings. Um, you're doing that from really day one for us. I remember actually like the second day of dental school, we had, we were doing gross anatomy and we were working on virtual um, lab, like humans and like how to drill. And I remember I would drill and it would, you, your score starts with 100 and it just keeps going down. And at one point, I remember I was two out of 100. And I remember thinking to myself, 
oh my God, I, I can never be a dentist. I don't know how to do any of this. And it just, uh, the reason why I tell you this is don't doubt your abilities, okay? You're, you're, you're always going to be at a point where you question yourself and you're like, there's no way I can do this. This is so hard. Remember that if there is a will, there is a way. Just keep going, keep asking, use your resources around you and don't give up and you will reach your goal. Um, and then, you know, in general in dental school, you're either gonna get a DMD or a DDS degree. The DDS is a doctor of dental surgery and the DMD is doctor of dental medicine. It's really the same. So when you're applying, don't even consider that as like an aspect of, for you to consider. It's, it's the same. Alrighty, so when you graduate from dental school, most people are general dentists and then 22% specialize. So a general dentist basically does a little bit of everything, but they don't necessarily specialize in one thing. So some people decide, you know what? I just want to do this one thing and I want to be really good at it. Okay. So for me, I was like, I want to, you know, just see kids. I want to focus on that. And I want to be the best at seeing kids. And that's why I decided kids and special needs. And that's where I specialize. There's endodontists. Endodontists are specialists that do root canals. Uh, there's orthodontists, braces and aligners, oral pathologists who study oral diseases, an oral surgeon that does surgery, all maxillofacial surgery. So head and neck, face, um, they do a lot of extractions. They do implants as well. You have radiologists who use different radiology techniques to diagnose diseases in the head and neck. Um, you have a periodontist who's a gum disease specialist. They also do a lot of implants as well, and they can extract. A prosthodontist is somebody who does veneers and crowns, like what people call the Hollywood smile now. Um, and public health dentistry, where you're in the public health sector and you're doing more you know, on a policy level. And that's really rewarding too. Not done as much though. Alrighty, another fun fact. So did you know that the average human produces 25,000 quarts of saliva in a lifetime? That's enough saliva to fill two swimming pools. It's good for you to know in dentistry, you're gonna know all of your anatomy, the parotid gland, the submandibular gland and the sublingual gland. Alrighty, so. A little bit about what I do specifically, pediatric dentistry. So pediatric dentistry is a specialty that provides comprehensive care. So it's literally everything that a, need, a kid will need from a preventative point of view and a therapeutic, like treating any oral diseases. And that's for infants and children all the way through adolescence. And people often ask me like, can you see not kids? Yeah, I was a general dentist before I was a kid. But, you know, once you're a specialist, you just want to stick to your specialty. I personally see kids like zero to around 25. So once they're gone to college or they'll come back and then I'm pretty much done after that, they start seeing a general dentist. Um, to become a pediatric dentist, you have to complete an after dental school, after your four years of dental school, you do an extra two to three years of specialty um, just so that you can, you know, learn specifically about the oral health needs of children and special needs. And by special needs, that can range from autism to Down syndrome to cerebral palsy to really everything. And it's very rewarding and fun to learn about all that in residency. So in my personal residency, this is what we worked on. This was what the exposure that I had, which is why I chose this program. And it's really important when you guys are there to look at that. So you look at non-pharmacological behavior guidance techniques. That just means like how to, to deal with kids and behavior management techniques to get them to do what you want them to do without giving them medicine. So, and believe it or not, like your tone level, your voice, um, how you say things, the, um, what, the way you, um, we call it tell, show, do. Like you, you tell a kid something, you show it, and then you do it. All these small techniques that you're going to learn are going to, go a long way with dealing with kids. Then you have nitrous oxide, which is the laughing gas. You can see in this picture, it's that nose that we put in and it helps 
um, it has two really functions. It's an anxiolytic, meaning it helps with anxiety, and it's an analgesic, meaning it helps with pain too. So we use it frequently um, with kids. You'll see almost every pediatric dentist is going to have nitrous oxide in their um, clinic. We also do oral conscious sedation, which is basically we're sedating the kids with medication where they're conscious, so they're not completely asleep. And um, it's a very technique, highly, you must be highly trained to do this for because you're dealing with kids and you want to make sure you're not overdosing them and you're doing it properly. And you'll learn that in pediatric residency as well. And then you could do general anesthesia with an anesthesiologist. Basically when cases are really tough and I'll go over cases with you later where we have to put the child completely to sleep. So we, where they're completely unconscious and that's called general anesthesia and so you can complete the work because when you have like, let's say a three-year-old or a four-year-old that has a cavity or in infections on almost every single tooth, you're not going to be able to work on him and do quality work just, you know, in the chair. So you, sometimes you have to put them to sleep to really give them the oral health care that they deserve. And then we manage dental trauma. We, like I told you before, we manage special health care needs. Um, I was trained in Bellevue Hospital and Rose F. Kennedy Center, where we got to see really a lot of cases. Um, then we had the hematology and oncology consultation. We had the Hassenfield Children's Center. So I'm just showing you the exposure you get to have in residency at, for to become a pediatric residency that will make you prepared to see special needs kids. Um, you'll see, you know, patients with craniofacial anomalies. So um, kids who have, you know, cleft lip and palate or Pierre Robin syndrome. Um, you also will learn how to do ortho treatment, not as an orthodontist, but, you know, the beginning stages of um, ortho treatment. When do you refer to an orthodontist for treatment and what to look for in habits? And then silver diamine fluoride is actually something a fairly new in, in pediatric dentistry, which is a medication we use to stop um, cavities from getting bigger, especially with kids, you know, sometimes we don't want to put them completely to sleep or um, put, get them to the hospital for let's just say one filling and there's no way we can complete that. So we can use this medicine as a way to buy time until the child's a little older and we can use more behavior management techniques. Alrighty. So after dentistry, I mean, after residency, um, you know, there's so many different options. Some dentists are solo practitioners, meaning that they just open their own business and they work on their own. Some have partners. So like, you know, let's say I'm a pediatric dentist and I have a friend who's an orthodontist and another friend who's a general dentist and you guys can join together and say, hey, let's open up a group practice together. Nowadays, there's a trend towards doing that just because people kind of like to, to have a one-stop shop at one place. So like for me, I work with my father now. He's an orthodontist and a pediatric dentist. So it's nice for kids. They can just go to that one place, get their braces and their dentistry in one place. Um, most dentists, I would say, work four to five days. It really depends if you have an associate working for you um, or if you're in the beginning part of your career. When I first opened up the pedo side to, in my father's practice, I, you know, I would say I was working way more than 35 to 40 hours. You're just setting up so much policy and you're doing a lot of staff management, not just the dentistry part, but remember you're running a business. There's a flow to things. You're learning insurances and billing and, you know, all of that takes a lot of time. So I always say, yes, having your own practice is rewarding, but it also means a lot of work and a lot of commitment. And usually the more work you do in the beginning to establish a practice that's well run, it will save you a lot of hours down the road. Um, and a lot of dentists you'll see will not retire, you know, right at 65. A lot of people might just cut down some hours and work part-time in a practice and sell their own practice. Some people go into teaching. So you really can do a lot. Um, I love, love teaching. Um, because I'm just so busy with my practice right now. So what I, my teaching was with the NYU dental students going into those outreach programs and providing, you know, service for um, underprivileged communities. Um, so you can really find something to fill whatever niche you're looking for.
All right. I thought that was interesting that the first electric toothbrush was in 1939. Isn't that amazing? And it was in New York. All righty. So uh, what does it, you know, what does a day in a pediatric dentist's life look like? I promise you it's not always extracting baby teeth like this. Sometimes it does look like that, but we really perform oral and neck exam. We look for abnormal cysts. We look for um, normal swallowing, thyroid. We look at everything in the oral head and neck. Um, we perform a comprehensive oral evaluation. We look at the tongue. We look at the gums, um, not just the teeth. Remember, you're looking at really everything in the head and neck. Um, a lot of times, like let's say I'll have a kid who has like a little pimple here or a scratch here. I always have to ask about it. I have to, you know, write it down, evaluate it, make sure by the next visit it's gone. If it's still there, I need to know why it could be, you know, it could be any type of thing that I should look out for. Um, also, another thing is the pediatric dentist is often somebody who the kid sees frequently because we see them every six months where maybe they're not looking, they're seeing their pediatrician once a year for just a physical. So, you know, unfortunately, you know, I've even had kids who um, go through neglect or, you know, that go through um, abusive parents and you might be the person that notices and I've unfortunately had that experience where there was a child who every time came in, they always seemed to be a scratch on his face and or a bruise on his face. And, you know, you start to wonder, there's always a story there and there's always something. And, you know, I you document everything really well. And at one point you have to you're the person that's that child's advocate. And you, you know, I had to report it and it actually ended up being that it was an abusive case. So it, it just made me realize how important it is to really, you know, your job as a healthcare provider and documenting things properly where I could have been like, oh, it's just a scratch, it's, it's nothing. But when I write it down and I document it, and I'm like, hmm, three months later, another scratch somewhere else, and then another bruise somewhere else. So, you know, that's another thing with a pediatric dentist, you're really the child's advocate and kids can't express themselves as well as adults. So you really have to look out for them. Um, we apply a lot of, you know, sealants, which is a preventative layer on top of teeth to prevent them from getting cavities. So we do a lot of preventative approach. We take x-rays um, and interpret them to see cavities and diagnose bone levels and any abnormalities that we see in, in the mouth. We extract teeth, we remove decay cavities and fill them. We prescribe medications for infections and we look for pathology in the mouth, anything that's abnormal. We also take impressions. If let's say, you know, a child's missing his front teeth um, and he can't get implants until he's a lot older. I actually had a, a nine-year-old who was in a car accident and lost his, both his front teeth and they were already permanent teeth. So, you know, he's in school and he's always like, can you do something about that? And like, we're not going to place implants or like a long-term thing until he's a lot older because he's still growing, but we're not going to let him go to school with nothing. So we created a, an appliance for him. And I remember the day we delivered it, he just could not stop looking at the mirror. He was just so ecstatic. And it's just, it's, it's awesome when you get to see that. And then we also treat special needs children and you know, I, that also is a whole learning curve in itself. I remember I had a child, he was autistic, he was 14 years old. And, you know, his mom has taken him to so many dentists just to be able to look in his mouth. And she was so sure that he had some pain, but like nobody was able to look in his mouth because he would never allow it. Long story short, eventually, we were able to get him to cooperate and do everything, but he just wanted to be on the floor. So if he sat on the chair, he wouldn't do anything. But he just sat on the floor one time. So I decided, you know what, let's try to do the exam on the floor right behind him. And he opened his mouth and we were able to do everything. We eventually even did the treatments that needed to be done on the floor. So what I'm trying to tell you is you with, you know, with kids, with kids with special needs children, you have to be creative and you learn that. It works. It really does work. Every kid is different. There's no one shoe fits all. All right. This is a panoramic x-ray that we usually take for a child at 
age seven to make sure that they have all the permanent teeth. So like here, you'll see this is like the baby tooth and this is the permanent tooth under that hasn't erupted. So we make sure that, you know, we always count, make sure all the permanent teeth that are supposed to be there. Um, we look at here, there's some structures that are important. We look at the coronoid process. We look at the jaw. You know, we look at the, the floor of the mouth over here. There's certain things that we look out for. All right. This is another panoramic x-ray. This was actually taken on a 20-some-year-old. And if you notice, do you notice, like, there's this really big, large black area right here? So this ended up being a pathology. It was actually a developmental cyst. It's very rare, and it's benign. It's called an OKC. And he had it removed. It usually comes in... Um, the third decade, so like in their when someone is in their 30s and they're 20% of jaw cysts. So these are things that we look out for. You know, we I remember in dental school we had a 50-year-old woman who we did a panoramic in and we saw some calcification in her, and it was right here, where's the where it's the carotid. And we sent her to her um, cardiologist and looks, and they told her that she had so much blockage that they're so that they're so happy that she came because it, it, she could have eventually had a heart attack. So just just telling you how like it really it's comprehensive care and you can diagnose things from x-rays much more than you know you'd think especially for adults. So did you know Egyptians used a form of toothpaste over 5000 years ago? I thought that was pretty cool. Just shows you how far dentistry had started. Back 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 and how oral health was always important. This is implants. So this is, I'm sure all of you have heard of it right now. You know, you could replace teeth. It's kind of neat now with implants, where before, you know, you would have to um, put in these, uh, uh, what do you call them, dentures and whatnot. Now we have more fixed appliances. Here's an example of like a cavity. And then after we filled it, looks healthy. And this last is a picture of sealants. So a before and after. Alrighty. All right, salary. Everybody loves that. All right. So for a dentist, I would say the typical dentist usually makes about 133. I would say that's on the lower range, to be honest. Um, it also really depends like where you're practicing and if you have your own practice. I would say this, this is for a dentist who's an associate working with somebody else. You could definitely make more than that by a lot if you have your own practice. As a specialist, it almost doubles. So, um, you know, any specialty, ortho, prosthodontist, pediatric dentistry, you're looking around 250. And again, it's that's if you're just working for somebody. If you are opening your own practice and you have your own business, you can definitely exceed that by a lot. So that's what's nice about dentistry. You really, it's up to you. You know, some people are like, you know, I'm happy with that. And I just want to work a couple of days a week for somebody and I'm good. And some people are like, no, I want to have my own practice. I want to, you know, maximize my potential. So it's, everybody gets to practice the way they want. There's no one right way to do it. So the future of dentistry. So I unfortunately high debt, you know, dental schools are getting more and more expensive. Um, and that all sometimes forces you to practice in certain locations. But I always tell people, look into loan forgiveness programs. I know there's some, you know, sometimes if you have, you know, so much loans, you can even, they offer you some, um, you know, you can go to like a local area. I mean, it will be in the middle of nowhere sometimes, but you go and do two or three years and you get, can repay all your loans. So just something to consider. I always say it's not a reason not to go into dentistry. The loans is not a reason not to get into dentistry. You will get out, you will make good money for yourself and you'll be able to pay back. Is it a pain in the butt? Yes, it is, but it's worth it. If that's what you want to do, it's worth it. And it's really cool nowadays. We have CAD cams, the computer aided design and manufacturing. Um, a lot of places now, like, you know, they take an impression, they actually scan it, they scan a tooth, they prep the tooth and they deliver the crown the same day because they can just do 3D printing in their office. So dentistry has really changed a lot. We barely take impressions of, with the gooey stuff now. We just scan and just send a digital file to the lab. 
So it's it's pretty cool where dentistry is um, arrived now, and we're more prevention focused, where we're trying to prevent cavities rather than just like fix them. All right. Did you know that a sneeze zooms out of your mouth at over 600 miles per hour? Isn't that crazy? How cute is this little one? <laughs> All right, I'm gonna go over a few cases that I thought would be fun just for you guys to see. I hope it doesn't bore you. I'll try not to go into the details too much. But this is um, a child I saw. He was seven years old, seven months male. He came in for um, to the, to see me. And we actually ended up seeing him in the OR in the operating room under general anesthesia. His chief complaint was his mom stated that she's not sure if he's in pain or not, but he has bad breath. And then we went and we, so always when we look at any child, there's different aspects that we look at. We look at the past medical history, we look at the birth history, we look at the dental history and the social history. Because remember, every child is different. It's not just looking at the teeth. You're looking at so many factors that are inf influencing his oral health care. So for him, the reason why we ended up looking at him in the um, ER, in the under general anesthesia, under the OR, is because of his medical history. He had history of GERD, he has G6DP deficiency, he was anemic, he had laryngomalacia, he had auditory neuropathy spectrum, he had cerebral palsy. So a lot of complications medically that we needed to make sure we can perform what we needed to do while, you know, doing it at the safest, um, with the safest manner. And then medications, they're not taking any medication. And notice we say denies because we don't know 100%, but it's what they tell us, right? And then allergies, he didn't have any allergies, no known drug allergies, his immunizations were up to date. ASA is basically a classification that we use to evaluate the health of an individual. So ASA one is a pretty normal child, like let's say ASA two, everything is healthy, but he has asthma and it's controlled. ASA three, you're getting into the more complicated stuff and so on. Um, the birth history is also something that's very important to look at. Um, a lot of kids who go through trauma and needed to be intubated or go to the NICU, we end up seeing that that does affect their development of their teeth and whatnot. So it's always important to ask for birth history. Um, he was a 37 weeker. He was a twin as well, C-section. He did have some complications. Um, his dental history, his first dental visit is at three years of age. So he didn't make it to the dentist till at three. Usually we wanna see them by one. He was born in the city. So, and he, so he drinks fluoridated water. He brushes about once a day. So this is all important things that helps me evaluate him and um, do the right treatment plan. His social history, he's, you know, mom said he's high in frequent intake of karyogenic foods, meaning a lot of foods that can cause cavities, caries, like sugar intake, um, or snacking a lot. And then mother denies tobacco smokers in the house. So no smoking exposure. So that was him. So you could see, um, you know, when you're looking at it from this point, you're like, oh, okay, it's not too bad. But look over here. Do you see how his gums are completely eroded? And this, a lot of it is because of GERD, because of the acidity. And you can imagine that tooth over here, when, that is the nerve you're looking at, okay? So this kid is in a lot of pain. All right. And, you know, because of his condition, he's not necessarily expressing that to his mom. So and sometimes, you know, when kids are in pain, they'll act out their behavior changes and, you know, they tend to be more aggressive. They're not their performance in school is affected. So I remember seeing this mom a few months later and she was like talking to me about how his demeanor and his personality was changing. And she really thinks it's because he's not in pain anymore. And it's it's and it gets really hard for parents, especially special needs parents who try their best to do everything that they can and knowing that their kid was in pain and that's why they were acting a certain way. 
All right, these were the x-rays. So you see over here, you can see all this black radiolucency. So when you see this black, this means that bone has eroded, bone has been eaten away. So when you see white like this, it means bone is healthy. Here, basically there's no more bone because the infection ate the bone away basically. It eroded all the bone. So same here, you can see that as well. So these needed to be extracted and we needed to pull them because we also have the permanent tooth right here and we wanna make sure the permanent tooth is not developing in an infection environment where there's bacteria and germs, right? Alrighty, these, um, so this is what we call bite wings is, is pictures when they're biting their teeth and we take the top and bottom. PAs is when we focus on specific teeth. So we're not doing the top and bottom, we're just looking at a certain area. So I wanted to look more at these teeth that were infected to see how bad they were, to see if I could still save them, but definitely we could not save them and we had to extract those teeth. Alrighty. So to go back to on the patient YA, this was his problem list. Like that was his medical problem list. This was his, his dental pro problem list they included a symptomatic, meaning he could he was feeling it pulp, like a symptomatic pulp means a pulp that's in pain. He had non-restorable caries, meaning cavities that we can't fill anymore because the tooth is so broken down. He had an increased overjet, meaning his teeth were very much forward. And that is often a problem, especially when kids, like you see it over here, when kids of special needs, because it's easy for them to, to have trauma. So if like they fall or they do any type of accident, when your tooth is, when you have an overjet and your teeth are, you know, protruding that way, your lip is not protecting your tooth as much. And it's more likely to, you know, receive some type of trauma. He had a lot of plaque and calculus, which is the tartar. He had gingivitis, which is gum inflammation. And he had cavities and he had attrition, which is basically the erosion that you saw in his teeth from the GERD. And again, those were his problem lists. He he's a high caries risk just because of his medical condition, of his poor oral hygiene habits. And he's like frequent snacking and just a lot of sugar in his diet. All right, so did you know that children begin to develop their primary, their baby teeth, six weeks after conception while they're in their mother's womb? Do you see how early that is? Six weeks after conception. So a lot of times when we see certain things in the mouth, um, we know that that happened in utero. You know, sometimes mom will say, oh yeah, I, I got really sick and I was in this high dose of antibiotic for this period of time. And that could affect the development of teeth that early on. Alrighty, case two. So this is a five-year-old female. She, prevent, she presents for an emergency visit. So she came in, she pointed to tooth F, which is an upper front left baby tooth. And she was saying that she had pain on F spontaneous. So like sometimes it hurts her, sometimes it doesn't. Um, and she was saying that pain is triggered when she's biting. And mom had given her like Tylenol over the counter pain medication to alleviate the pain. So that's what she'd come in for that visit. All righty. So we looked at her medical history. Again, um, we looked at all these different aspects. So for her, she didn't really have a significant findings. Her medical history was pretty normal. She was an ASA one. She had full term vaginal delivery. She did have a history of viral croup, but not anymore. So overall, she was a pretty healthy child. Um, again, she brushes once a day, not the best dental history. She did have an increased BMI. We always look at that for kids because that also gives us an indication of like their diet. Um, she had, she's the youngest child. She had one sibling. Sometimes that's important too, because, you know, if we're dealing with a, let's say a family of eight, we could see why mom would have a hard time. Like the, all these things are contributing factors. Patient drinks soda and juice frequently. Mother works full time and denies knowledge of patient's breakfast or lunch daily. A mother denies tobacco smokers in the house. 
So all these things are very important when I'm doing a treatment plan, because let's say maybe I would plan to do a filling, but when I know somebody is a high caries risk, I might do a little bit more aggressive treatment just because I know it will last longer. All right, and that was her. So we always take photos like this too, because we look at her facial dynamics. So she's somebody we would call, she's mesocephalic, meaning she has normal, um, like her nose to her mouth, they're pretty proportional. We, and I won't get into the details of all that, but all right. So those were her pre-op photos. So before we did any work. So you could see, I mean, visually, you could see how many teeth are broken here. Her enamel layer, what I was telling you, the hardest substance in the body was completely eroded here. So that must have been a lot of sugar and sweets and, you know, a lot of contributing factors that led to that. And look at all these cavities over here that I can see as well and all that. All right. And she was saying that it was this tooth that was hurting her right here. All righty. We took again some x-rays. So we took the bite wings, which is top and bottom. And again, I can see these holes, right? I can see how close it is to the nerve. So like you see this part right here, this gray that you have inside the tooth, that's what we call the pulp. So when you have a cavity that's all the way to the pulp, like this over here, you're going to be in a lot of pain. You basically have bacteria where your nerves are. And dental pain is one of the worst pains people have. It's like your teeth are fine until they hurt. Then it's like an, a, really, a real emergency. And we ended up taking a panoramic x-ray just so we can see her development and everything and because of her age. Um, this was actually an x-ray that someone took and do you guys notice something's off? They forgot to take their glasses off, okay? You always wanna make sure all metals are off, but I thought it turned out to be a pretty picture, so I left it in there. <laughs> Alrighty. So for her, her problem was medical, she didn't really have any problems. Dentally, she had a pulp that was exposed that was hurting her. She did have, um, missing teeth. Um, she had one baby tooth that was missing, probably from decay and eventually just came out. Um, she had a lot of crowding that probably made brushing a lot worse. But you get the picture that we're looking at it from a comprehensive point of view. We're looking at socioeconomic, dental, medical, and then that's how we really create a good treatment plan. So Let's see if you guys were paying attention earlier. Do you guys remember what year the first, what was it? It was 1939. Yeah. In the chat hour. <laughs> for you. Awesome. All righty. Last case. So this was um, JF. He was four years, eight months. Um, mom came in saying he fell yesterday on the playground and he didn't let me brush his teeth because he said they hurt. So. He came in and looked at his medical. His medical looked great. His birth history looked fine. His dental history was good. We always talk about a dental home, meaning a child has established a place where he goes to the dentist from one year of age. And you always want to make sure every child has a dental home, just like they go to their pediatrician. They have to have a place where they're being evaluated orally. All righty. So that was him. You could see over here what we call a hematoma. So he has that between um, his teeth where he, the injury happened. And you can see his lower lip, there's an abrasion. So that's where he fell. And probably what happened is like he bit on his lower lip. And that's how he got that abrasion. So always when we look at that, we want to make sure that sometimes teeth chip just a little bit and they can actually go into the lower lip. So we've actually had it once where a kid chipped his tooth and mom's like, oh, we don't know where it is. And we took an extra of the lower lip and it was embedded in his lower lip. So it's always important to look at everything. And then we ended up taking an x-ray. We took an x-ray just to make sure that the tooth wasn't infected. And we saw something really strange. So do you see over, I'm like, I looked at that. Of course, I don't expect you guys to look at it and see that something looks strange. But what I was looking at is I'm like, hmm, there's something here that looks extra. 
couldn't figure out what it was. So I took a closer image. And do you see right here, can you see the borders of a tooth? So he has what we call a mesiodense. He had an extra tooth, a supernumerary tooth. And not only was it growing right between his two permanent teeth that haven't come in yet, it was actually growing the wrong way. It's going towards his nose, not down. So this is definitely something that we need to look into and make sure that it's addressed at the appropriate time so that it doesn't affect his permanent front teeth. So that's the picture of it. And that's what we call a mesioden. All righty. So just to kind of sum it up, I want to tell you, obviously, I'm just a little bit biased. Pediatric dentistry is so much fun. We always have fun in the office. We always dress up and, um, you know, it's just with kids. You get to be goofy. And this Halloween is big in our office. We always have so much fun. Um, and it's just a field where it never gets boring. Um, always be the reason someone smiles today. Really go the extra mile. And it's never crowded. I always say that, you know, people talk about, do you think there's too many dentists? Like, do you think it's still rewarding? It's like everything is what you make of it. Everything you do is what you make of it. You could, you know, be a dentist that's miserable and have a like eight to five job and, and you can make it really fun and love your staff and create such a good environment that where everybody wants to work in. So you are in control of your life. You are the leader of your life. So, you know, make good decisions. You're still young, explore, ask, learn, shadow. This is your time to do all this stuff. And it, it will be all worth it, I promise you. Um, I'm also a big proponent on just being part of organized dentistry. I tell you that. So one day when you're in dental school, you remember what I tell you. You know, dentistry is one of these professions that are still going and we still have pretty good um, dental rights, I would say, if that's the right word. Just like good dental benefits. And we're always our... Um, compared to like our medical colleagues, for example, because we have such organized dentistry that is good and because people support organized dentistry and we have a lot of representatives and dentists who go in and lobby to make sure that we have, you know, the right coverage for these kids in our states and whatnot. And it affects us and it affects the kids as well. So be an active member in your society. And when you get into dental school, hopefully, I know you guys will, you know, be part of organized dentistry. And this is five advice that I, I was trying to think, like, just to sum it all up, all right? One, shadow in the field before you commit. Don't say, I'm going to be this, I want to be a dentist, or I want to be whatever it is before you shadow. Shadow, get that experience, ask all the questions, get that exposure. Diversify your application. Make it not boring, okay? Be different. Be you. If you know you're, you know you're a piano player. I don't know what what it is that you like. Any of your hobbies, like show that. Be passionate about. If you're passionate about it, show them that that's who you are. It, there's no one applicant that looks great. Whoever you are, just be the best version of who you are. And then another thing is apply early. I see that that's a mistake that's often done. It's like people have these great applications but are just too afraid to apply. Like you already know when the AdSAS application is going to come out. Everything should be ready by then. All you have to do is open that application, create a login, and just fill everything out. Your personal statement should be already done by then. All these things should be done. The earlier you apply, the better chance you have. It's just, it's a number, it's game. When they look at your application, and there's, let's say, 50 seats, and there's only two more seats available, they're going to be a lot pickier than when there's 40 seats available. So apply early, apply, apply early. And do not give up. If you didn't make it the first time, apply the second time, apply a third time. What's two or three years in your life from your whole career in your life? Okay, that's what you want. Don't give up. But just don't do the same things, right? If you didn't get accepted the first time, know what it was and then try to do something different, whether it's doing a post-op program, a post-back program or 
whatever it is, like a master's program, but do something different. Don't just wait for a year and just reapply. Show them that you worked hard and that you, you did something in that one year. And then I always say, reach out and learn from those who've already been in your shoes. You know, don't reinvent the wheel. Um, you guys have my email, you can, or other dentists, like don't be afraid to reach out and learn from other people. It'll just save you so much time and effort. And I'm telling you, most people want to help you. So just reach out and get the help you need and don't be afraid to ask. And that really concludes my presentation. I hope you guys found it helpful. I do have my contact information right here. Um, I did start doing for my patients some YouTube videos that I found helpful for the moms and dads. Um, feel free to follow. And I that's my Instagram account. Please feel free to email me. This is my email address. If you're in Virginia and you want to shadow or you're visiting or you have family, you guys are more than welcome to come in and shadow. And let me know if you have any questions. Well, doctor, thank you so, so much for being here and for that wonderful presentation. We really appreciate you taking the time to do this for all of the viewers and students watching. Of course, I'm so happy. I'm grateful for, thank you so much for inviting me. And let me see if there are questions in the chat. I do not see any right now, but I guess we can start off with what has been one of your more, or I said, what case do you think is most difficult that you've done so far, whether in residency or in your current uh, practice? Um, as in like the work was difficult? I mean, any aspect, maybe work or like a, case, a specific case. Um, I think for, you know, the hardest part of being a pediatric dentist, I would say, is not, you know, the actual dentistry is not the hard part. You know, once you get trained, you become really confident at what you do is, um, I would say, difficult parents, you know, when you see a child that really deserves the best health care, and you know, they're in pain, or, you know, they, and you know, they're not getting what they deserve because their parents are not necessarily the best advocate for them. I think that's the hardest part of my job, you know, knowing what's best for the child, but not being able to do it because a parent doesn't want to do it. Or, you know, I remember in residency, I had this mom who only came for emergencies. So would only bring her child when he can't sleep at night and they won't, they'd send him back from school because he's crying the whole day. And whenever we tell her, oh, he needs, you know, we need to fix this tooth. He has a cavity. She wouldn't do it. But then she'd wait until that tooth is infected and the kid is crying and in pain and then come. And then we're just pulling his teeth at that point. And that was really hard to watch. And, you know, because there's only so much you can do at that point. All right. Thank you for that answer. And then I suppose for, this is a question that we ask um, all the dentists that we have as guests on this channel. And it is, if you could go back in time, maybe back to when you were a pre-dental student, applying to dental school or just an undergrad in general, what advice would you give to your younger self or just anyone else in that position? If you could go back in time, what would you say? Um, I would say don't stress as much. It's going to be okay. It's gonna be fine. And um, if I could go back, I, uh, I wish I, I was more involved in like learning more about the business aspect of the field and that I shadowed um, successful practices that kind of run well and not just focused on the dentistry, but also on running a practice. Cause I felt like at one point the dentistry is easy and you're just bombarded by practice management. Thank you very much. And I do see another question. And they says, how would you recommend to ask for a shadowing opportunity now, especially considering COVID? Yeah. So um, what I would do is I would send an email to the doctor or the, whatever email you find in their website, or even feel free to call and say, um, introduce yourself. Um, have a resume prepared 
say that at your, you know, I'm a third year, let's say that I'm a third year in college, I'm a junior, I'm really interested in dentistry, and I'd love to come in and shadow you. Um, I know that this is, you know, during COVID, there's regulations. If you're vaccinated, you can say you're vaccinated. Um, you, you can say I, you know, I strictly will adhere to COVID protocols and I'll be, you know, wearing a mask. Let me know if that's something that I can do. Most dental offices now are all vaccinated, like the staff are vaccinated and it's just much more controlled where, I mean, I've told you, I had so many people come in in shadow. The only thing what I did is that I would make sure that I didn't have two or three students at the same time. That way when I'm working, I didn't have like two to three people like right on top of me. So we coordinated the schedule the right way. But um, I mean, as long as you're, you know, you we check your temperature every morning and all that. I don't think it's a concern as much as you think it is. Thank you so much. And let me see if there are any more in the chat. I don't see any more. So I guess that will be the end of the session. Once again, Dr. Ahi Tain, thank you so much for joining us. We truly appreciate everything you had to say and all the advice you gave to us pre dental students, especially in application season that's going on now. <laughs> yeah, good luck. I really wish you all the best. You will do great. Don't give up. You will succeed. <laughs> all right. And thank you so much. And thank you to everyone that is watching. And the quiz will be opened in a few seconds. With that being said, thank you, everyone, for joining us. All right. Take care. Bye.